Thank you all so much for coming to our session today. Um, this is the religion and LGBTQ plus intersectionality session um, presented by Medtronic. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Josh Schneider. Uh, my day job is as a quality engineer. And when we created this workshop series, I was the chair of the Colorado Pride chapter for Medtronic. Um, now I've moved into the role of strategy and operations chair for our global network. And I'll describe the difference between kind of our networks and our um, local chapters later. Um, so today we wanted to give you a, a little taste of what it was like um, when we did our intersectionality series in 2020. So we have three parts. The first part is an icebreaker that we did in 2020 that kind of stimulates some in-group and out-group thoughts. So I'll have you all go through that uh, via Menti. The second session is a present, short presentation about uh, kind of what spurred the idea for, to do this session and how we did it. And then the third part is a fireside chat and Q&A um, with my colleagues up here. And that's kind of another taste of what we did in the session itself. Uh, we also have a 14 minute video of kind of some of the highlights from the session that we did. Um, so lots to look forward to. Um, so please hold your questions to the end and we'll do a Q&A. So real quick, um, just a few things about Medtronic and who we are. Um, so we engineer medical device technology. We treat more than 70 conditions. We touch two patients' lives every second of every hour of every day. 150 countries, 90,000 employees. Um, this is our company mission, to alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. And then this is the structure of our ERG networks. So we have five global networks. The Pride Network is our brand new network created in the last, uh, just in the last two years. We now have 8,000 members, 24 local hubs. And then um, we additionally have seven site-based employee resource groups, um, which are smaller and, and don't encompass that global network, but are more local. And three of those, you'll notice, the Christian employee resource group, the Muslims and Friends, and the Medtronic Jewish community are religion-based ERGs, which is something that might be somewhat unique to Medtronic from other folks that I've talked to. So I want to move into an icebreaker. So everyone, I'll have you get out your phones, tablets, or computer and go to menti.com. When the questions come up on the screen, um, take a moment to reflect on your answers. You can talk with your neighbor, see what their thoughts are. Um, we will then show how we conducted this icebreaker um, in our session in 2020. And we'll display some of the results that we got from our groups then. So the first question, and your Menti code is also on, on this slide. The first question is, what do other people think about my group that may or may not be true? And while you're answering this question reflecting, think about your group as potentially your pride group, potentially your religious group, um, or some other your group. Um, so what do other people think that might be true or might not be true? Um, and your responses will be displayed on, on the screen as we get that going. So some answers I'm seeing. Judgmental, uncaring, unwelcome to people different from us. that we are anti-religious, that we are disruptive and exclude people. Great. OK, can you switch back? So thank you for inputting those. Here's some examples that we got from our Medtronic Pride group. So we had each of our affinity groups and ERGs 
in separate Zoom breakout rooms. They could have discussions on their own um, and then submit their answers that we could all look at together. So they were all anonymous. So here's some examples from Pride. That we're one big monolith, while in reality we're quite diverse. Um, you know, coming out at work is easy. This is two examples. All right, and so you might see some similarities between what you all came up with and what's up here. Here's some examples from the Christian Employee Resource Group. Christians are judgmental. That one comes up a lot. Um, that Christians hate those that idea is LGBTQ+. Here's some examples from our Muslims and Friends, ERG. All Muslim people are Arab or Middle Eastern. May or may not be true. Um, Islam is a violent religion and Muslims identify with terrorism. And here's some responses from our Medtronic Jewish community. That somehow we are special, chosen people. People believe being Jewish is our nationality. All right, so the second question, same thing. Um, what do you want other people to know about your group? So this one is kind of going the opposite direction. What do you want to share with other people that is true? Some responses that come up. Diverse and welcoming. We are humans. We live and breathe just like everyone else. Religion and pride can coexist. All right. Thank you all for participating. So we found this icebreaker was really powerful to get people to think about other groups other than themselves and how they can think about others in a more open mindset. Um, so here's some examples for that question from our Pride ERG. Um, sex and gender are not the same. Something we might think is simple, but others might not know. Um, it's OK to ask questions, but not invasive ones. You know, sexual, or sexual questions you wouldn't ask a heterosexual person. Here's some responses from our Christian ERG. Not all Christians are judgmental. Um, Christians really want to love others. Here's some responses from the Muslims and friends. I want others to know that Muslims are extremely tolerant, loving, caring people and treat women with great dignity and respect. I want people to know that one of the main teachings from Islam is to help people and not bring harm to others. Here's some responses from the Medtronic Jewish community. It's OK to ask us about our religion and beliefs. We welcome everyone and love to trade ideas and recipes. <laughs> All right. So I'll move into kind of the second portion of our workshop today. So I have just a few slides to talk about why we started with this idea and how we went about doing it. So we noticed that there were some areas of conflict between our Pride ERG and between the religious ERGs at Medtronic. And some of you might have experienced this at your own companies. I've heard it in other sessions uh, this week so far. One instance that we saw was in our internal uh, network news articles that were celebrating things that the Pride Network did, like raising the flag in Pride Month, or celebrating coming out day. Um, there was often negative comments left, and most of them would use religion as a weapon um, to discourage our Pride ERG from making progress and being visible. Um, so that was our first instance of, of really realizing that there was kind of a gap or some conflict between our groups. The second, specifically in Colorado, where my hub is, 
Uh, the Christian Employee Resource Group there did an annual event that supported um, an organization that had a very anti-LGBTQ plus leader. And so for us, just that you know, support, even though it wasn't direct, um, was kind of another issue that we felt like there was a big gap between us. And how, we, how could we bridge that? <clears throat> so um, really, it, when I was thinking about how can we bridge this gap, I attended an out and equal session with Tannenbaum. You may have heard of them. They work with a lot of religious groups. They're a fantastic resource, and I use their website extensively when preparing uh, this workshop in 2020. And I would absolutely encourage you all to go and use their website and resources as well. Um, so when preparing for this workshop, I wanted to have a clear, distinct message. And that message was, there are LGBTQ plus people who are also religious. It's a basic statement of intersectionality, but at the time, it felt like it needed to be said. My key goal for the workshop was just to encourage better understanding between our ERG groups. We had quite a few people in the Pride ERG that had no experience with religion. And there was a lot of religious folks in our ERGs who had no experience meeting or talking to someone from Pride. And so I really wanted to encourage this dialogue. And so one of the main ways that we encouraged this was we wanted the religious ERGs to be able to choose their own speaker for our event. And so we met with them several times over the course of many months and encouraged them to choose a speaker that could present their views on um, what it was like to be LGBTQ plus in the workplace, or rather um, their views about you know, how that we can coexist and have courageous conversations together. And to kind of cast an overall pride um, light on all of these events, at the end of the event, we had a fireside chat where we had our, our very own TK, um, Heron, sit down and have a fireside chat with the presenter from the religious ERG and talk about what was presented and how we can have those conversations in a meaningful and constructive way at work. So in that way, we were demonstrating to our ERG members how to have those conversations and what that can look like in the workplace. So in order to open this conversation, we had to reach out to multiple partners. And in order to avoid getting sent to HR later down the road, um, we decided to bring them in in the beginning and make sure we got that sign off and even included our inclusion and diversity team as a key stakeholder um, right from the beginning. And all of this kind of culminated and led to us able to cross this rainbow bridge between the gaps and start to open some courageous and taboo conversations at work about the intersectionality of religion and sexuality. So um, we've kind of reached the point where we're at our, our video today. So again, we've compiled some highlights from one of our sessions for you. And because of some of our speaker privileges um, for the Christian uh, speaker, we weren't able to use his video. So instead, we have some highlights from um, the video with Rabbi Mark Soloway, who is our speaker for the Medtronic Jewish community. And you'll see also in this video uh, Michael Barker, who is our um, inclusion and diversity representative. And you'll also see uh, TK in the video as well. So enjoy. And just to situate myself a little bit, as uh, you said in the bio, I'm rabbi of a congregation in Boulder. It's affiliated to the conservative movement, which is a slightly misleading word, um, especially coming from England, where the conservative uh, party is <laughs> a political party and um, not, not necessarily uh, embracing the values or many of the values that I believe in. But I do, uh, the conservative movement briefly situates itself kind of in the, in the middle of um, the denominations. It has a, a great um, respect to the rabbinical authority of the past, going back to 2,000 plus years of, of tradition post the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which is where the whole Jewish lens used to be at one point. And Judaism has evolved in all kinds of 
of, of fascinating ways. And uh, what distinguishes the different denominations is how we relate to the rabbinic authority of Jewish law, because Judaism is quite a, a, a legislative, legal-based religion. And it's just so very clear that um, human beings are created B'Tselem Elohim in the, in the divine image, in the image of God, and they're created male and female. And, and the, the first story in Genesis 1, it's not so clear that that was two separate beings, but perhaps one, one uh, being with multiple sexual possibilities. Uh, in fact, the rabbis say that the, the Adam Rishon, the first human being, was actually a kind of androgynous with, being with both male and female organs, which, um, which to me has always sort of indicated that human sexuality is very, very complex and nuanced, and we we'll all have that kind of balance of male and female within us. But the, the most important thing, and I really will end with this in my introductory remarks, is, that, is the whole notion of being the Hebrew words betselem Elohim, in God's image is that every human being, no matter who they are, what they believe, who they love, color of their skin, etc., 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 is created in the divine image. And we have no, no right to, um, <laughs> if, we, if we dismiss or, or, uh, or, or write off or judge uh, any other human being, then we are basically closing ourselves off to a different manifestation of God's face. So, Rabbi Mark, one of the follow-ups I have for you, um, you, you, you began to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the sacred texts and, and how the interpretation of those texts, you know, is, is evolving, has evolved over time. I'd like to invite you to maybe to talk a little bit more about that, but also with, with this sort of point to it is, as you think about that, um, how does that view enable uh, you as a person and certainly folks uh, within your faith community to um, to really have dialogue with folks who perhaps view sacred texts differently than perhaps you do? To me, I've always, always, always been, as both an artist and as a religious practitioner, just I've always been terrified by people who are not able to see nuance because I think everything is about nuance. I think uh, good religion, good science, good art is all about asking questions and being in, in the conversation and being in dialogue. And I think, for, in my mind, and sorry if this sounds judgmental, but in my mind, bad art, bad science, bad religion, bad politics is about thinking that we know all the answers. So I, I think that it's a multiplicity of voices that are reflected. In a, it's a conversation, the Talmud, which is this voluminous work of rabbinic teachings that spans about a 300 year period um, is, a, is, is the recording of multiple conversations and multiple voices. And yes, some people try to distill the essence of it and, and give a very strict line about what Jewish observance, Jewish practice, Jewish belief is. But I mean, certainly my tradition is, is much more about always uh, looking at the different ways in which those questions can be asked and framing them differently. So I, I love interpretive tradition. The rabbinic idea of midrash, which is basically a sort of filling in the gaps kind of storytelling that, that, that tries to understand what's going on in, um, inside the emotional and spiritual lives of the characters of the stories of the, of the Torah. We don't really, you know, the Torah doesn't always tell us what's really, really happening on an emotional level. And, and, and some of the examples we have of of human experience are not so positive. There's dysfunctional families, there's fratricide from the very beginning. You know, we see violent, we see a, a, an incredibly violent world, like shortly after humanity's been created and God being displeased with that world. And all of these are moral lessons for our age. You know, we, we see the violence in our own society. There's a, 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 a well-known rabbi called Rabbi Shlomo Kalabach who used to say the Torah is a commentary on the world and the world is a commentary on the Torah. There's this reflective way in which we look at our texts. The rabbis uh, have this Hebrew phrase called kavod habriot, which is best translated as human dignity. And they say that if human dignity is at stake, then even some of the most strict laws um, of our tradition can be sacrificed if you are compromising the dignity of another human being. And this principle was taken, by the way, in my own movement, in 2006, which, you know, doesn't actually seem like very long ago. It's not very long ago. But in 2006, there was a radical turnaround to a, a very full um, inclusion of the LGBTQ community. 
uh, for the first time in 2006, uh, fully out um, people from that community could be ordained as rabbis and cantors in the conservative Jewish tradition. And of course, the big sort of uh, Leviticus 18.22 is like a big, big deal for, 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 for Jews and Christians specifically, because it's the, it's the verse that says very specifically, and it's not about, um, it's not about two women, but it's very specifically about the, the, the prohibition of an act, of a, of a sexual act between a man and a woman. I mean, sorry, between a man and a man. And it's um, w what I find fascinating about it is in some, some parts of the Christian world that's taken as like absolute proof that, um, you know, God completely has no, uh, no tolerance for, 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 for two men who love each other. But if you look at it in its full context, it's talking about a very specific, uh, potentially cultic practice uh, where one man was being subjugated by another man, potentially. I mean, there's different ways to read that text. But it's certainly not legislating about who can love who. And it's certainly not um, denying that, you know, people of the same sex can fall in love with each other. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no way that the Torah does that. It may be talking about a very specific uh, act but, but even that has been, has been interpreted and reinterpreted in different ways. You know, one of the things you mentioned was, in this word I wrote it down, uh, nuance. And, you know, TK, I'd like to kind of get your thoughts. So, um, you know, as, you know, as a black man, as a, as a gay man, as a Christian, um, when I think of nuance, I think of, of this, staying away from this us, them framework. And you think about the LGBTQ community, and I like, I like your perspective from a Christian perspective. Oftentimes the community is seen as an issue or a problem to deal with at, from a Christian point of view, as, as opposed to a community of people you know, to love. And so I would appreciate just from your life's experience and your vantage point, how do we, again, stay away from the us versus them framework and see, uh, you know, see, that there are people that we need to connect with um, and really, as, even as we talk about these issues of difference? Yeah, it's, um, it's, that's a great question. And where I always start with is um, centering on what is Christianity and it is a community. And, and the, the founder of the movement is Jesus Christ. And if you read Jesus's teachings and the element of or the lived experience of being gay, you go back into scripture and says, what did Jesus say? Now, as Rabbi Mark pointed out, you know, we go to Leviticus and some of the other um, Old Testament scripture, but within New T Testament scripture and sometimes how scripture is used um, to control or to marginalize um, is not necessarily through the founder of Christianity, but through the founder's followers and their interpretation. And it's always within that context of their first century, second century, third century lives. So when it gets to nuance, I, I, I love what the rabbi said, it, it goes back to being open, a variety of opinions and not coming across as I know. And I'll be the first person to say, I don't know and I'm fascinated to, Continually, continuously to learn about scripture, about history, about the background. Um, and I think it just comes back to this word we use, uh, what is your hermeneutic lens? And, you know, do you take it as a very literalist, um, getting to some new points of original, but can you take something as literal without context? Um, and as the world has, has evolved and learned, I think that's important, especially to avoid the us then context us, them conversations. And I also want to go back to a point of, um, of scripture where it says, you know, whosoever, this aspect of welcoming your neighbor and the stranger um, in the community, the beloved community, I just find it hard to believe just how some of the rhetoric and um, the traditions really exclude versus include. And I, I just personally have a, a challenge of saying, how is that love? How is that peace? How is that a faith, if you will? You know, TK, I was thinking about listening to what you said and, and Robin Mark, Robin Mark, I'd like to even invite you maybe to answer a similar question. I mean, we're sitting here 
today, we're having a very, um, I think, very good, very meaningful conversation about these topics. But we know that, generally speaking, folks, they have difficulties talking about this stuff. We have dif difficulty talking about this stuff, certainly, you know, in wider culture, probably also in Medtronic. And, you know, even with the few minutes left, I'd like to get comments from you and TK about how can we, you know, how can we build those, build those bridges? How can we have truthful, authentic, but loving conversations with others that perhaps we disagree with on these topics? I mean, it all comes back to love, like TK was saying. I mean, I, I just can't, um, I can't countenance the idea that any of our faith traditions don't have the starting point of love. The fact, you know, I mean, I'll <laughs> out myself and say it was me that wrote the post-it note that said that the Torah says 36 times to uh, 36, 36 times it says, you shall love the stranger because you know the heart of the stranger. You know what it is to feel like an outsider. You know what it is to feel marginalized and vulnerable and threatened. And so we are commanded again and again to love the stranger because we know that experience. And so anybody who is feeling marginalized or vulnerable through their identity, whatever their identity is, we have an obligation to, to, to know them and to love them and to be, have, have curiosity about who they are in the world and have compassion for who they are in the world. And I think that, um, you know, you know we, it, it, not just on this issue, I mean, we know we're an incredibly, painfully divided nation right now. And there are people who just uh, so tightly hold on to their version of the truth. But we know that the whole essence of the truth has just, has just been cheapened and, 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 uh, and, and, and thrown away. I mean, there's an amazing story about the, the angel of truth um, kind of arguing with with God when uh, when God was about to create the human being, saying they're just going to create lies. And it, it's a long story. We don't have time for the whole story, but it's a beautiful story. But the end of the story is that, that God takes truth and throws her down to the ground and then creates the human being anyway. And it's understood to mean like we it, truth is not, there is no ultimate universal truth in heaven. Like there's there's partial truths in, in, in even the opinions and the that we most, are challenged by the, the the people that we're most threatened by. We have to recognize that they too, as I said earlier, are, are a manifestation of, of God's divine image, and therefore, you know, we 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 have to understand that they have. And it's really hard right now. I mean, it's really hard for me to to, to really see some of that uh, truth in, in in some of what's being expressed in the world right now. But I think that we we're obligated to. We're obligated to. To love every every human being, we're obligated to to see that they too are a, are an expression of the divine, and that they um, they may have some access to to, to a, a partial truth that we don't yet understand or that we don't yet know. So hopefully you can see why we wanted to share that with everyone. That was pretty impactful. So we'll move now into kind of our third section of our workshop today. So we have a fireside chat, which again is hopefully going to give you a little taste of what it was like to be in one of these sessions. So we're gonna have a fireside chat today with um, my esteemed colleagues here beside me, and I'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves. Alrighty. Good morning, everyone. My name is Griffin Barrington. I'm a supplier quality engineer at Medtronic. Um, I also am the chair for our Boulder Hub of our Pride Network. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Um, my religious background is a variety of different traditions while growing up, including a little bit of Southern evangelicalism. Uh, currently, I'm active in a mainline Presbyterian church. Good morning. Good, mor good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for those joining us, and good evening around the world. My name is Talarius Heron. As you heard, I go by TK. My pronouns are he, him. I am the Vice President of Inclusion and Diversity at Medtronic. I identify as a black, out, queer man. Um, my, I study theology. I was asked to participate, and I always say yes. Um, my focus areas is the intersection of reform theologies uh, liberation theology and black theology, specifically around, around Pentecostal churches. 
So I bring a lot to this conversation, and I think that's why <laughs> they asked me, TK, would you be interested? So, so yes, thank you for attending. We said, TK, you are crucial to have this conversation. <laughs> So while TK was voluntold, I was volunteered <laughs> on my own. Um, I'm Lisa Wallawaki. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. My job at Medtronic is I'm the Vice President of America's Customer Care and Shared Services. Um, for our Pride Network, I am the executive sponsor for our Environment, Culture, and Community work stream. I'm also part of our Medtronic Jewish Network, so I'm a good Jewish mom. I have recipes if you want them. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk after. It's almost matzo ball season. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm an ally to the community, and I'm very pleased to be here today. All right. Thank you to our panelists. All right. So I'm so happy to see your faces and for us to be up here together. So um, I'm going to start, TK, with you. So candidly, you know, conversations with you at prior out and equal conferences and other events that we attended together about how you you have kind of wrestled with your um, religious and LGBTQ plus intersectionality, and that kind of drove you to you know your studies, um, and um, that was a big influence on why I wanted to create this series was your story. Um, but I'm curious, you know, when you move through your day job. Um, how do you choose when to share or not share pieces of your religious background or pieces of your um, sexuality at work? Yeah. Well, thank you, Josh, and thank you for your vision for this, this series. Um, I think it's, it, I center around inclusion, and I always say that if it's going to be helpful or hurtful, a when and how I share, especially my background. But I always say, I always start with, I'm gonna be authentically who I am. And so I will share with you, yes, I come from a, a strong faith tradition. Um, I call it Bapticostal. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, the piece, that is who I am. Fortunately, when I was on my own journey to reconcile my faith traditions, uh, what I was taught and my sexuality, I didn't walk away. And so many people walk away. And so that is important to me and for me to be authentic of who I am and what I bring to the table, even in my day job as inclusion diversity at Medtronic. Now I'm also centered around, will it be hurtful? So if it's going to distract, especially my role um, and how I have to be objective as part of the work that I do, I don't share or I'm careful about how I share and what I share, but I'm always gonna center in who I am. So that kind of, your answer, like you sometimes have to change depending on who you're talking to. If it's, you know, the pride ERG, you might share specific things um, versus if you're talking to one of our religious ERGs. Yeah, I don't know if I would say I would change it. I would be, I would adapt and I'll be flexible mm -hmm. so that the person can hear me and receive whatever we're discussing or connecting. But yeah, there's times where I'm sharing freely and there's other times it's like, is this going to be helpful to get us from A to B or whatever we're discussing? So yeah, I, would, I would reframe it to say it's more so, um, am I going to be helpful in the conversation and will they hear what I have to share or what they actually need to receive? Great, thank you. Um, Griffin, kind of same question to you, I guess. <laughs> um, do you feel like you share some parts or, or don't share other parts depending on who you're speaking to when you're at work? Definitely, yeah. I think um, we put a lot of emphasis on being authentically you and bringing your whole self to work. Um, but if you're not able to um, enter into these conversations or have this like kind of baseline understanding, like Rabbi Mark was saying, of the dignity of everyone, it's hard to bring um, these parts of my identity that may uh, on the surface seem like they are contradictory or their intention with each other, it's hard to bring that into the workplace and really um, really be my full self. Um, you create this compartmentalization that then creates awkward you know, conversation dynamics. Um, it, 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 you end up spending more time in your head thinking of how can I get out of the situation without giving up too much mm. um, that, mm -hmm. that you know, limits your conversation, yeah. 
Do you feel like, do you have any tips or tricks that you've found that kind of help you either be more authentic or kind of um, bridge those gaps? I think where I've found a lot of strength and a lot of, a lot of purpose is being upfront with the parts that are surprising to people and working through some of the working, I, like I know what stereotypes or what thoughts people have about Christians or about gay people. Um, and so if I can proactively get in front of those and show that I am not that, mm. or I am, you know, I am accepting and inclusive and religious, um, if I'm able to steer that and make sure that that's the groundwork of what you understand about me, it makes it so much easier going forward. Um, and not in like a, like, oh, I'm just gonna like throw myself at you or like, you know, uh, but in a respectful and like tactful way, it, it has been helpful. Great, thank you. So Lisa, um, you've been you know, a vocal and visible ally for us in the Pride Network and we really love that. Um, thinking about your day job running you know, a large multifunctional international organization, um, can you give us an example of how leaders can be better allies while still advancing you know, an inclusive mindset? Yeah, you know, I think it's a lot about having open conversations. So, um, you know, just to kind of frame up, I have an organization of about 800 people, and on a quarterly basis, I run town halls. And in advance of those town halls, I ask for questions, and just to make sure that, you know, people feel comfortable asking whatever they want to ask, um, I let them submit questions anonymously. And you never know what you're going to get, and often it's like, can we work at home permanently, or can we wear jeans, you know, <laughs> but the tough ones. Um, but, <laughs> but there's a question that came in, and, and I'm actually going to put this question up on screen, and I'm going to read it to you verbatim, because it, it, it threw me a bit. Um, it said, I'm terrified that someday one of my transgender friends will ask me to affirm the use of preferred pronouns, and, and that this will be the end of my career at Medtronic. I avoid all pronoun usage altogether because for religious reasons, I cannot use preferred pronouns. What protections are in place for people who respectfully decline to champion preferred pronouns? In my heart, I always hear the repeated message that I will not be accepted at Medtronic if anyone finds out that I'm a religious conservative, that I have no hope of climbing the ladder, and that I really don't have a place in the work world. Wow. I'm like, don't you want to know about genes? Like, <laughs> like, yeah. You sure are really this? Um, you know, so in all seriousness, I had to read this question several times um, and really think about how I was going to answer this. You know, I knew I had an opportunity to demonstrate my allyship, um, but I also thought about how stressful it must be for somebody to feel this way. So, you know, if you're going to practice inclusion, you practice inclusion. Um, this person could not balance what was expected in the workplace while being true to their faith with those things that they felt didn't align. Um, and, and I thought it was important to acknowledge their struggle, um, but also share that I didn't see this as an issue about religion. I saw this as an issue about fostering an inclusive environment. So, you know, quite frankly, I, I took a moment and I threw out some lifelines, um, you know, TK, are, you know. I had a different opinion, but we'll <laughs> So I threw it out. And, <laughs> and you know, and, and our chair of our Global Pride Network, some friends in HR, and, and I got lots of good input, but ultimately, to be candid, I sat with my HR business partner and I said, you know, I've just got to really be real about, about how I approach this. So, you know, I, I thought about like what conversation, what, what would my parents have taught me? And, and what did they teach me? And, and how was I raised? And, and so here's, here's kind of how I addressed that. I said, you know, no person at Medtronic should be afraid to bring their whole self at work, we talk a lot about that, or be worried that their identity or their beliefs are gonna impact how their performance is viewed. You know, performance at Medtronic is viewed on both your what, so what you accomplish, and your how, how you show up, and how you behave. And, and there are numerous ways that we can foster an environment of inclusion and belonging. Using pronouns is only one way of doing that. And creating space for people to speak their truth and soliciting ideas from others, those are all ways we can do this. 
But ultimately, all employees need to be treated with dignity and respect. So, so here's what I said about pronouns. First of all, I said, pronouns are not preferred. They just are. That's number one. Hey, thanks. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I said, using the pronoun is no different than using somebody's name. So I told you my name is Lisa. If you call me Fred, it's kind of disrespectful. <laughs> so if I tell you my pronouns are she, her, and you call me he, him, it's equally disrespectful. That's that. Nobody is asking you to change your religious beliefs. Just think about the pronoun as simply a way to refer to somebody. And that's it. Um, so I didn't know how that was going to land, to be honest. And I'll tell you, my team is vocal. As you can see, they're not afraid. <laughs> so you know, I was waiting. And quite frankly, I had TK kind of teed up and, and ready to hear stuff about how I answered this. Um, and so I, I got a number of emails afterwards, all favorable, all. And I said, all right, so they're not going to tell me the bad stuff they'll tell him. <laughs> but it didn't happen. So if you want to just you know, click to the next slide here, just, and I'm not going to drain this slide, but you can just read. You know, there were some, these are representative of a number of responses that I got. And I felt really good about that because it was a way to just demonstrate allyship and, and help people sort through the issue in a very, what I felt, simplistic way and, and sort of tribute to my parents the way I was raised. Josh, real quick, before we move on, I just yeah. want to say I think this is something that's also crucial about the success of this program and something that we saw is it's one thing for the Pride organization to put on a workshop once and bring in a speaker and say some very eloquent things. And like in corporate America, like just like all our emails, it goes into the archive bin immediately. Um, we need leaders like Lisa that are outside of the specific and inclusion and diversity where we expect to see this language. And we need them in the normal operations and middle management and things so that they know that this extends beyond just an initiative in one group. This applies to all of us. So, yeah. No. So, you know, it's no secret that, at least in the United States, we've kind of had a very divisive culture. Um, building on your previous reply, can you share an example where you have addressed that head on um, in a way that helped your employees feel heard? Um, and, seen com and seen comfortably, um, despite knowing their views may differ from their leader. Yes, yeah, so I'll share another story. Um, one of my direct reports is an extremely conservative Christian, to the point he and his family run a private Christian school. Um, and, and his beliefs are, are very, very far to the, the most conservative in, in Christianity. And I knew this, and he knew sort of my support for all of this work, and it was kind of weird sometimes. Um, we, we have this thing in my leadership team where we talk about the elephant in the room, so when we get together face to face, I bought everybody little stuffed elephants. And, <laughs> and, and the idea is when something comes up that feels uncomfortable to talk about, you throw the elephant into the middle of the room, and it's like, I have an elephant in the room, and it just kind of breaks the ice so we can talk about it. <laughs> And so in this spirit, you know, this workshop that, um, that Josh created had come up and, and, and I knew that there, and, and there had been like all this stuff on, you know, comments on our intranet, it was following Pride Month. I, I knew this was an elephant and he was even afraid to throw it. So the, the, second, um, the second sort of chapter of this workshop was coming up and I said to him, hey, check this out. You're coming with me. So like any good Jewish mom, I schlepped him along. We went, you know, we went together. And I'm like, let's, let's go to this together. And it happened to be the one where the Christian leader was speaking. I said, let's just talk about it afterwards. Because I don't want there to feel like there's this weird tension between us. So we went and we listened and we talked. And so, you know, in preparation for today, I asked him if he would be okay with me telling Kind of about our interaction and what he would like me to convey from him about that conversation. So he said, you know, look, as our culture gets more divisive, um, we have 
people who are just wrapped around the axles are hand wringing over how to handle it and what to say. And he said, you know, I was upset that people were saying things and others were too. And the, he, he said, I didn't feel like anyone sought to listen. And then he reached out to me and said, I'd like to listen and I'd like to talk. And he said, you know, the fact that some vice president was willing to just open the conversation like, yeah, you went there um, and have this conversation. He goes, all of a sudden, I felt seen. I felt heard. And, you know, we don't need to agree, but you respect me bringing myself to work. And for that, I can respect you bringing yourself and your beliefs. He said it, and honestly, it took the elephant out of the room. And I thought, gosh, something just as simple as don't be afraid to go there and have the conversation. Don't pretend, and, and Josh had a slide up before, like lose the whisper. Don't let the whisper happen. Just talk about things. And, and so he said, you know, honestly, by, by the end of that conversation, I felt like I had a voice, the elephant was gone, and it wasn't a distraction anymore. I didn't have to go to work every day thinking about that. And then I thought back to the person who submitted the question, which wasn't him, by the way. I did check, I asked. <laughs> Um, and, 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 you know, and he said, it's just the fact that you are willing to be open and transparent. And he said, you know, look, and I'm not going to promise you this had like a super happy ending and that he's accepting of everything. He said, I'd still feel uncomfortable if you asked me to call you him. I don't know if I could do that. He said, but I understand better. A and that was really the start. So, you, you know, for me, it's about, about active allyship and, and not being afraid to have the conversations. A and I think this workshop really open the door for that. And, and so you just can't be afraid. Even as a big global company, you can't be afraid. Well, I would just add, you know, it, we often say, bring your authentic self to work. And I often, you know, comment to say, that doesn't mean people are leaving parts of themselves at the door. It's, it's either you really believe that and you really going to accept that with the framework of dignity and respect. So we can agree to disagree, but your rights are going to stop where my oppression and marginalization begins. And so, I mean, there's, thank you. So the, the aspect of being a DEI, DEI practitioner is to make sure that we're practicing this inclusion work. And that means all, and even those uncomfortable conversations, and I have to give it to Josh and the Colorado Pride team to say, let's have this conversation because Medtronic, unlike some organizations that either do not have faith-based ERGs or have interfaith to try to minimize it, or kind of where we're at, it's like they're part of the conversation. So let's make sure that we're being inclusive and it's to seek to understand, educate, but not from an oppressive, oppressive t standpoint and not from a lacking dignity and respect for others. Great. Thank you, TK. Thank you for your answer. So I'm going to ask one more question for our um, panel here, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, so think about what questions you might have. Same thing for our virtual guests as well. So Griffin, um, I want to talk a little bit more about intersectionality. Um, what challenges have you had to face that other gay men who aren't religious might not have to face? Um, and how have you overcome them? Man, I used my good answer for the, the one you asked earlier. Um, no, unfortunately, I, I, so I think it's something that, quite honestly, people experience, even if they're not religious, as far as just uh, this tension with the very vocal understanding of scripture and, and understanding of human sexuality that's been perpetuated for a long time. I think that's something that, um, so I said that I grew up in, um, in a couple of different traditions. For a long time, I was part of a, a, an evangelical church um, and that really challenged me and, you know, I struggled with understanding myself and accepting myself through that lens. Um, it, it, you know, I went through some very dark times because of what was projected onto me from this group um, and my understanding of myself. And so uh, that's a challenge. I think the way that you overcome it, the way that I think we tried to incorporate into our se series was being exposed to a variety of different opinions within the same umbrella group. Um, it's, you know, it, they're very vocal about this kind of strict adherence to very textual or literalist interpretations of scripture. 
Um, but that's not the case in all aspects. The church that I go to now is very accepting and affirming and takes nuance and understanding. Um, and it's something that my struggle was I had to find that and really internalize that to be able to then live my life authentically and honestly um, and, and be happy like I am now. So that, you know. Great. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, can I get a mini round of applause for our panel, please? All right, so Q&A time. So we have about 10 minutes. So raise your hand if you have a question in the audience. And we have some <laughs> volunteers with microphones. Um, you can start, pick someone over there, I guess. We have a very uh, excited person yeah. right there. OK, next, next. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Um, TK, I really appreciated the comment where your expression ends where my oppression begins. I, uh, my name is Mia, by the way. My pronouns are she and her. I grew up in a very Southern Baptist church that my family, uh, my, my uncle's the pastor. And so we had gone, had a guest minister come in, and he spoke about how um, we needed to have society free of homosexuality. And so everyone in the church kind of turned and looked at me and I refused I didn't want to respond because I, I could feel all the eyes so instead I had a shirt created and it says God loves me too and instead of love I had a heart and I had the inclusive rainbow as the heart and so I just wore my shirt to Bible study I wore it and I never it was never something that I felt like I had to discuss because people saw it and they got it and then I started getting requests my 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 cousin's trans can you make it the heart trans colors and so it just turned into something that I was able to show up and be my authentic self and not have to abandon the history and my involvement and my active involvement in my church. And so I think that what you said really spoke to me because that's kind of how I'm choosing to live my life with religion. So thank you. Well, I, I would just say thank you because visibility matters. And there's just so many of our stories that need to be heard and seen. So continue, thank you. Thank you. All right, more questions? Maybe we'll go for one from this side first. Oh, yeah. perfect. Thanks. There's a button. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Kiriako, uh, pronouns he, him. Um, my question is, we talk about bridging the gap between those who are religious and um, people in our community that are as well. But what about bridging the gap between the people that have walked away because of their past traumas. Because I feel like before I even start bridging anything within our company, between our two um, ERG groups, I really won't have a lot of sway within our own group because our own group is very divided in that regard as well. So you said your own ERG is divided? Uh, well, yeah, or your company so is divided between kind of these two groups? Well, there's a lot. There's a lot of division, <laughs> right? So. <laughs> Um, I'm mainly focusing on those in our pride group who, and I would say the majority are those that have walked away because of whether it be past trauma or trauma that they haven't decided to talk about because, well, it's traumatizing. And um, within the community in the South, I, this is just speaking from North Carolina, um, there's not a lot of people that will openly talk about like, oh yes, I'm religious, it's more of like, yeah, I'm religious, and it doesn't come up in the club, or it doesn't come up in sure. anywhere else. Yeah, so I'll make a comment, and then I'll let you say. So I would say, you know, our goal for this workshop, and what I see as our goal as the Pride ERG at Medtronic, is not to heal people's past traumas, right? I don't want to force them to talk about their traumas, or to bring that up if they're not comfortable. More so I want folks who are intersectional and want to bring that side of them to work to feel comfortable doing that. So having these workshops or even having conversations um, with those people and say, you know, being open to talking to them about their faith if, they're one, if they want to talk about it, I think that should more be the goal of, of kind of our workplace. 
Um, anything to add? Yeah, I would, I would add, this is a great opportunity for just collaboration. Uh, number one, I would say, um, is there a need? Because I recognize your question, I understand your question. Um, is there a need and do the, does the topic want to be broached? Because again, separating from it's not a therapy session and feeling trauma and drama, but are people open to it? And if they're open to it, then I would say, let's connect on resources and speakers to be more of a welcoming, open environment to have that dialogue. But there's many resources out there, happy to connect. But I think it's an important conversation, but does a, does a group want it? Does it need it? Because some people just don't want it. They're, they're good. So. Yeah, that person back there was very excited. <laughs> Um, I'm Darian, Capital One, Richmond, Virginia, she, they pronouns. Um, my question's for Lisa. Um, what was your answer to the other part of that question that you were asked during your town hall? Um, we did mention pronouns, but I would really like to know how you finished um, answering their question, which was that they don't feel like there's a place in the workplace when workplaces are becoming, you know, so, proactive and, you know, woke, I guess, sorry. Yeah, thanks for the question. Y you know, it was really just focusing on behavior of respect and inclusion. A and so if you respect the others, n nobody is going to judge based on your faith. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that our performance is based on our what and our how, and our how is the way we show up. And as long as you aren't disrespecting your colleagues, there's nothing that will prohibit you from, from moving. Everybody should be able to bring their full selves, um, just not in a way that's disrespectful. Um, do we have some questions from our virtual audience as well? You know, volunteers, maybe we'll take one from uh, we, our virtual. We have one okay. that I was going to read. Um, so this comes from someone that says, what advice do they have for companies that are afraid to have a faith-based ERG? TK, I, take it away. So I anticipated this Don't question do coming it. up. <laughs> <laughs> I need to see a therapist. <laughs> Your legal and HR team, and if you have a D DEI office, they all need to be on the same page. Um, there are some, especially within the US, there's some legal implications. Um, so I would say just make sure they have the right engagement up front. Um, and is that really where you're, that's, I'm sorry. So I was mentioning that DEI, HR, legal all need to be on the same page because there are some legal implications. Um, and is your organization ready for it? Um, because it is some work. Uh, believe me, I have, I have battle stories, war stories. Um, but it's rewarding when we talk about inclusion, when we talk about bringing your full self to work. Uh, but just make sure you have those three stakeholders aligned. The microphones. There. Hi, my name is John. Uh, uh, pronouns are he, him. I work with PNC Bank uh, as a diversity recruiting strategist. Um, thank you all for speaking today. Uh, it's great to hear that you know you all have faith traditions that are accepting um, and inclusive. Um, but as you know, and as we've heard from people in this room, there are millions of people um, you know across across the globe that interpret the same texts and use that interpretation to inflict oppression on people you know, across the world. So my question really concerns, where do we as queer people draw the line of wanting to be inclusive and accepting of people no matter what their you know, religious affiliation may be, while at the same time working to dismantling structures that continue to oppress people across the world? I think that's a fantastic question, and I don't know that I have the answers. <laughs> um, you know, as, as we kind of talk about this topic and, and we think about what impact can we have as an ERG and as a company, and 
you know, we've started to include our senior leaders, and that really gets us into the conversation, you know, in our boardroom or in um, Medtronic as a whole, right? And we're a global company. Um, but we started here with what impact can we have as, as an, our ERG, and that was really in our local community. Um, so I love your question. I think it's important. Um, I think it was probably a little bit out of scope for, for our, our workshop. But Josh, have, I, yeah. I would add this real quick. Um, I constantly have to remind our faith-based ERGs that we're not a religious organization. We are an organization, we have a mission, we have values. And so to Josh's point, some of that's out of scope for us and we make sure that our ERGs are aligned with specific pillars, education, bringing in talent, partnerships. But when we have faith-based ERGs, we have to remind them sometimes it's like, it's not about proselytizing, it's not about interpreting scripture, is that we're here, we work for organizations. Um, so that's, that's another aspect of this. Um, but I would say have those conversations, go for it. So I, th I think we're probably just at time, yeah. um, but I, I want to go a little off script here and just recognize Josh for an amazing moderator. <laughs> and, and Josh and Griffin, who really had the courage, and this was an incredibly courageous thing to do, and you know our fearless leader, Sean, who's the, the leader of our Global Pride Network, says this thing, no conversation about us without us. Um, and they really embraced that and, and brought it to life. You know, I wanted to call this workshop, Yeah, We Went There. <laughs> Big, it was really, really bold and brave, and I just couldn't admire you, you guys more. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you all for coming. Um, we will be around um, to answer all those other burning questions. So thank you very much. <laughs>